Good morning, Gap Church, and a very warm welcome to our service today. Also, for all viewers that may be joining us today for the first time, I hope that you're encouraged and uplifted as we worship the King of Kings. I'm going to read as a call to worship from Psalms 95, 1 to 3, and then we'll go into a time of praise and worship in our opening song. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout out joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Come, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you are the King of Kings, the King above all gods. Lord, thank you for today that we can come together at this time, in this way, in praise and worship to you and to feed from your word. Lord, we come here broken. We come here in need, Lord, in need of love, in need of encouragement, in need of upliftment. Lord, thank you for all our blessings, the blessings we receive each and every day. May we feed from your bread of life today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Enjoy the service. Details of how you can make payments will be on the screen during the service this morning. As a church body, we really need to thank those that have given so much over this lockdown period. 
Money has been tight for all of us, but, despite this, the church has been able to run soundly on the finances received. For this, we are truly blessed and thankful. Our main outreach program has centered around providing food parcels to families that have truly battled to make ends meet. Trips to Macro have been expensive, but worth every cent, as we have been able to assist many families over this time, who would have had nothing if it wasn't for the initiatives of some of our congregation. This ministry needs to continue though, and we know times are only going to get tougher for some of our church family. So please be generous in your giving. It is written that God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want you to give under compulsion or out of guilt. I always enjoy Proverbs, the book of wisdom, and one of its pearls jumped out at me this morning. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed themselves. Although we do need your financial giving, this is not the only form of giving. After all, Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus his tomb. Some of our church family have given their time by standing in long queues to buy food for our outreach program. And the most costly gift was not financial at all, but God giving us his own son. What more could we ask for? He gave us everything and he is asking for a pittance in return. Whether be it your time, the first fruits of your crops, or merely a widow's two mites, please give cheerily that you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for satisfying our every desire and need. Your word says that we should give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Gap Church. A privilege always to spend some time with you in prayer. Come, let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you this morning knowing that you are a good God, that you are a generous God, that you are a God who loves to heal and loves to bless his people. Thank you, Lord, that our prayers do not fall on deaf ears, but rather they are received and responded to swiftly because of your goodness. Father, we think about the world around us and the turmoil across borders and within countries at the moment. And Lord, these conflicts come at a time that nations can ill afford, as the attention should be on curbing the spread of the pandemic and making sure that people and their livelihoods are safeguarded. So we pray for your healing hand over nations. We pray for a curbing of not only the pandemic, but also of conflict. And we pray, Lord, that nations would follow you and look to you for their help and make godly decisions in what they do. Think about our own country Think about the difficulties that our own government has in promulgating regulations for the greater good of all its people. And we pray for incredible wisdom where mistakes have been made, Lord. We pray that those mistakes would be corrected. We pray that political agendas would be set aside and that the focus, Lord, would be on undertaking for each citizen and particularly those who are most vulnerable. Lord, we pray in the weeks ahead that we would be united as a nation and not divided and that we would look to you also for our help and that we would make godly decisions about how to react to the things that are happening around us. 
Think about our own city and the conflict in our local council and pray, Lord, against that conflict. We pray that they too would stand united to make good decisions for the city that as a hotspot really needs effective leadership, selfless leadership, and good decision making. And we think about our own congregation and the folk in it, Lord, many who are struggling with anxiety and depression, many who are struggling with their personal circumstances because of the incredible strain that this pandemic has had on people's finances. And also, Lord, those that are struggling because of the solitude of isolation caused by the lockdown. And Lord, we pray that you would undertake for each person in our congregation, meet them where they are, guide them, mold them, bless them. For those folk that are ill in our congregation, Lord, Annie and Loletta, Merle, Numfezo, Sirlene, Alred, Daniel, and Stanley, Lord, we pray that you would heal them, that you would undertake for them, and Lord, that you would give them peace. We think about those recovering from illness, Hannes and Jenny, and Josie and Norma, and Trevor, Lord, we pray that you would continue to heal them. We pray that you would continue to undertake for them. And we pray, Lord, that they would have a real sense of your presence day to day as they return to full health. And for the folk that are on our broadsheet week in and week out who are struggling with cancer, Lord, Merlene and Hannes and Brian and Greg and Helen and Leandra, Lord, we pray that they would have the courage to fight against their cancer and that they would prevail because of your goodness and your healing hand. And in days ahead, Lord, we pray that we would be a congregation that meets together in great numbers again and where people stand up and share with the congregation how wonderful you have been, what incredible works you have performed, what healing you have brought about, what wholeness has come from your hand. And we look forward to those times. Lord, bless us in the week ahead. And as we hear the message this morning, Lord, we pray that we would be blessed and we pray that you would be overjoyed by the response of your people to your word. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. God bless you all.
Good morning. It's great to be back with you all. I trust you enjoyed the Pentecost service last week with all the different language groups contributing to the reading of uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, I think it's fantastic to be part of a global church, multicultural, multidiverse, uh, which spans the ages. Uh, we're part of a huge body called the church, and I think we're very proud to be part of that body. But today I want to follow on from Pentecost with the question, what was the purpose of God giving us his Holy Spirit? And there might be a number of answers to that question, but the one I want to give uh, will use the metaphor of the body of Christ or the church being the bride of Christ. And then suggest to you that the Spirit's work is to prepare us for the wedding of the Lamb, that marriage feast in heaven when we'll be united with our groom. So first, let's identify the spirit that God has given us. In one verse in scripture in Romans 8, uh, verse 9 and 10, basically, the spirit of God is called the spirit, the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. And so although God the Father is in heaven and Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, his spirit is in us doing the work that he has been called to do. And it was Jesus who said, it is for your good that I go away. Uh, unless I go, the counsel will not be given to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. John 16 verse 7. So the Spirit is given to us to do a specific work of preparing our hearts and minds and character to be a radiant bride for Christ. That's his function, to get us ready to marry the Son. As you know, most Mothers start preparing their daughters for their wedding from about five years old. Now, the moment you become a Christian, uh, the Holy Spirit begins the work of transformation to get you ready to be that beautiful bride for him one day. And in the same way that the Jewish father would elect and choose a son, a bride for his son, so God chooses and elects the bride from all the nations of the earth. It's an incredible privilege. We are the elect of God, handpicked by God to be the bride. But we don't start off very attractive. We come into this Christian life with all our baggage, all our weaknesses, our failings, our negative habits, and even our addictions. We're essentially selfish and self-serving. Our thoughts, words, and actions all show us that there is the old nature in us, that nature that uh, scripture speaks about particularly in Romans 7 and so even the good things that we come with are simply not good enough to please our groom uh, we told in uh, Isaiah 64 6 uh, your even your righteous acts are like filthy rags in his sight so this intended bride uh, of Christ uh, starts doesn't start off ready for marriage she needs some major uh, transformation work, and that's what the Spirit does. And he's patient and kind. He's called a comforter, a counselor, a guide that will lead us into all truth. And so he is given the function of uh, preparing us uh, for to be that bride. But unlike the bride who normally takes control of all uh, wedding preparations down to the minutest detail. We've got to hand over to the Spirit and let Him take control. He's a bit like a wedding planner, I suppose, if you uh, can want to use that expression. Uh, there's lots of Scripture that says He's got to have the control. Uh, scripture says, be controlled by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. Those Phrases are all to remind us that we've got to allow him to take control. I hope you get that. And so when you become a Christian and then try and take control back um, after conversion and you're not prepared to submit to him, well then you're not ready to, to, to be a bride for the husband. Uh, you show that uh, you, you, you want to control yourself and, and God doesn't want that in you. And so you're not going to be fit for the wedding. You've got to hand over control to him. So that's the first point, is give him control and submit to his work in your life. But what is he going to do? Well, 
I'm going to read a passage from Scripture, which is our reading today. It's Ephesians chapter 5, and my wife absolutely loves this first verse, say I with tongue in cheek. I'm reading from Ephesians 5 verse uh, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So when we initially read this, it seems to be that Paul is speaking about marriage. But at the end, he says, this is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and his church, the groom and his bride. And the groom wants to purify his bride or get her ready through his spirit by, what does it say? Washing with water through the word to present her as a radiant bride without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You see, that's how the Spirit gets us ready. He washes us by His Word. The Word of God is the prime way, prime channel, how God cleanses and washes and purifies His bride. You may remember from the story of Esther in the Old Testament that the Babylonian queens had to get ready to meet the king. And Esther herself went through 12 months of beauty treatment. She would bathe in six months in, with oil and myrrh and in six with perfumes and cosmetics. You can read about that in Esther chapter 2. And so when we read the word of God, the Holy Spirit is working and cleansing us and washing us and preparing us to be the bride he wants us to do. We clean our minds and hearts, our thoughts, when we read the word of God, as opposed to watching rubbish and junk, which puts in negative things and, and transforms us in the wrong way. We need a lot of scripture to do the cleansing uh, that is necessary. Jesus, after spending three years with the disciples, said uh, in John uh, chapter 15, you're already clean because of the words I've spoken to you. So Christian, by way of application, you need to read the word of God regularly if you want to be a bride ready for when he returns so you can appear before your groom spotless on your wedding day. Now the second thing that the Spirit of God does with us is take us through various experiences in life to give us practical lessons on how to get rid of those things which are in our lives which are unattractive and displeasing to him. We learn on the road, as it were. It takes time. And he's there to give us the help and comfort and guidance that we need to be able to do this, do that. And he essentially wants us to come through those experiences, often hard as they may be, uh, more like Jesus, more transformed. Because he knows Jesus would love to see those things, those characteristics in us. There's a scripture that says, find out what pleases the Lord. What, what does he want in his bride? Ephesians 5, chapter 10. Those characteristics that he's looking for. Galatians uh, 5 uh, tells us about those characteristics in verses 22 to 24. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. That's what Jesus wants to see in his bride. And Romans 12 says, be transformed, be renewed, become like that. The third thing that uh, the Holy Spirit wants to do uh, to get those lovely characteristics 
remembering that we don't start very attractive and lovable and lovely is to get rid of the negatives. Not only do we get transformed and put on the positives, but we've got to put off the negative things, those things that are, are displeasing to the intended groom. They call the acts of the sinful nature in Galatians 5 speaks about them. And we have to cast those things off like a, a dirty garment. Ephesians uh, 4, 22 to uh, 32 says, put off, put off uh, sexual immorality, deceit, dishonesty, theft, etc. But we're not very good at that because they're ingrained in our, in our characters and it's hard to stop doing what we've learned by habit to do. And so the Holy Spirit convicts and says that is wrong and gives us the strength to overcome. But we've got to allow him to do that and deny those things. Anyone who's not prepared to deny himself, says Jesus, is not worthy to be my disciple. So we've got to overcome those horrible things as a person would do in marriage. If he's got a bad attitude, he's got to change if he wants his marriage to work or she's got to change to make the marriage uh, more fruitful and enjoyable. But we need to rely on the Holy Spirit's power to overcome those negative things in our lives. Scripture in Galatians 5 verse 24 says, Those that belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. So we've got to kill those things stone dead and say no to them. Those are unattractive. We don't want to take those into heaven. Uh, we need to, to kill them and make sure they're not part of our characters. And we can't do that without the Holy Spirit's power. And then fourthly, a, a huge area where the Spirit has to work in our lives is to keep us faithful to Him, as uh, uh, to our intended groom. We must not fall in love with the things of the world and end up making idols and worshipping them. We have a picture of this unfaithfulness that can occur so easily uh, when we look at the Old Testament, when we see what the Jewish nation did, God uses words to them like, I chose you as a bride, I washed you and cleansed you and got you ready. And then you ran off like a prostitute, like an adulteress and prostituted yourselves to false gods. Listen to God's uh, lament over Israel in Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, a few verses of which I quote. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me. Without what fault did you find in me that you strayed so far from me and followed worthless idols? You have forsaken me, the spring of living waters, and have dug your own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Does a maiden forget a jewelry or a bride or wedding ornaments? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How skilled you are at pursuing love. So the Holy Spirit's got a hard challenge to ensure that we remain faithful and our eyes are always fixed on Jesus, our groom, and we don't find attraction in other lovers, whatever they may be, that we don't give our time, attention, resources and devotion to something that is not of God. And Satan comes along and offers us lots of things. And again, in Scripture, it's compared to the seductive adulteress, so beautiful, so attractive, but she's deceitful and her objective is to destroy you and pull you away and make you unfaithful to your groom. And the Holy Spirit will continue to try and warn you and say that is wrong. That course of action, that devotion to something else is not of God and you're becoming unfaithful to your groom. And he will challenge you to turn back. And sometimes he uses not only scripture, but people to challenge you to say you're on the wrong course. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to other people when they tell you you're going in the wrong direction. You're becoming unfaithful to your groom who loves you so much. And then fifthly, and the most important work of the Holy Spirit is to get us to fall in love with Jesus, our groom to be. He tells us that Jesus is the greatest groom in the whole world. Look at some of the phrases used about Jesus. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the lily of the valley. He's the altogether lovely one. He's the bright and morning star. And the Holy Spirit reminds you through scripture uh, how strong our groom is. Always doing right. Always standing for justice. Always kind. Always loving. Loving. Loving, always accepting and forgiving. Look at your groom as you read scripture, how he deals with the woman at the well. How he shows forgiveness for the woman caught in adultery. How he mixes with the downcast and the tax collectors like Zacchaeus. 
how he provides for his mother when he's dying on the cross, how he's the one who shows grace to Peter who has failed him and yet he brings him back. And the Spirit says to us when you read Scripture, look at Jesus, your groom. What a wonderful groom he is. But more than that, the Spirit reminds us that this groom will do anything for you. He's prepared to lay down his life for you. That's how much he loves you. In fact, he did lay down his life for you, his bride, to win you to himself. Friends, today I want to challenge you again to fall in love with Jesus, your groom, and get ready for the marriage of the Lamb to his bride and the wedding banquet that will follow in glory. I close by reading a lovely scripture at the last few chapters in the Bible, Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through to 8. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Friends, that's my prayer for myself and for each one of us, that when Christ comes to call us home, and it may be soon, that we are ready as a radiant bride, perfected by the Holy Spirit, working in us, transformed with all the characters that Jesus would love as he welcomes his bride to the wedding of the Lamb. To him be glory now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us. We realize we are unattractive as the bride of Christ. Often we let you down. We fail you. We struggle with our own addictions and areas where we fail you. Please forgive us and wash us and cleanse us by your blood. But Lord, give us the victory now that we wouldn't stay with all those sins. Help us to conquer them and release them and crucify them. We need you, Lord Jesus. Please, God, continue with the transforming work that you began in us that one day we would stand before you and we'd be pleasing in your sight, Jesus. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Let us close our service with a last worship song to give him glory as we surrender all to him.
Let us pray. Dear Father God, thank you that we are able to worship and praise you this morning in our homes. Thank you for your grace, love and forgiveness of our sins. Please help us with all the challenges we face during the week ahead and we pray that you keep us and our loved ones safe. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.